Hello, everyone. Good to see you all this afternoon. Welcome. My name is Carl Herzog. I'm the public historian for the USS Constitution Museum. And welcome to our panel discussion on protecting global commerce. Uh, I would like to start off by welcoming uh, our panelists with us today. Uh, Bob Allison, a professor of history at Suffolk University, uh, a trustee of the USS Constitution Museum, uh, and the author of The Crescent Obscure, The United States and the Muslim World from 1776 to 1815. Also with us is James Holmes, the J.C. Wiley Chair of Maritime Strategy at the U.S. Naval War College and the author of Red Star Over the Pacific, China's Rise and the Challenge to U.S. Maritime Strategy. And Rockford White, a Director of Maritime Studies Program at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Uh, and a founding partner in several organizations related to maritime logistics and support. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon, this afternoon on uh, East Coast US time. Uh, I appreciate you coming in. This uh, panel discussion today is part of a suite of virtual programming hosted by the USS Constitution Museum uh, and funded with the assistance of a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we appreciate that as well too. Uh, we've come together today to talk about this topic um, because from the very beginning of the United States through to today, global maritime commerce has been a fundamental element of the United States economy and by extension, uh, its economic policy and foreign policy. From the very beginning of the establishment of the US Navy, that was sort of a central element of its mission and one that was uh, important to USS Constitution in the years leading up to the War of 1812, as well as for uh, decades after that war. Uh, and you could argue uh, as part of that war as well too. Um, and that has continued through to today. That mission continues to resonate with the US Navy deployed uh, in overseas ports around the world today, and in some particularly volatile zones uh, around the world. And so as we see the headlines about maritime security and global trade uh, today, we want to take a minute to look at the uh, context of today's global commerce uh, from the perspective of USS Constitution and what it might be able to, to help us understand about the situation in the world today. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Carl. Um, Bob, I'd like to start with you uh, and talk a little bit about the um, history of early trade in uh, maritime trade in the United States and the role of the Navy in protecting that trade, in particular in the Mediterranean, which uh, obviously was central to the Navy's uh, initial uh, founding as a standing Navy in the 1790s. Uh, and continued to be a presence uh, through the 20s, 30s, and 40s. What was so important about the Mediterranean and how did that trade uh, sort of fit into the global commerce pattern for the early Republic? Well, that's a very good question. And really, thank you for putting this panel together, Carl. I really appreciate what the Constitution Museum is doing to have these kinds of discussions about timely issues in which uh, the ship played a central role. So, um, in the seven, well, Thomas Jefferson, the first Secretary of State, in his report to Congress on the Mediterranean trade, actually one of the first reports he wrote, said that the Mediterranean was a response, about one seventh of American trade went through the Mediterranean. It was responsible for that big a piece of American commerce. And of course, in the 1780s, the Algerians had begun capturing American merchant ships in the Mediterranean. And this is what one of the things that's provoking the creation of the constitution of the the document the new federal government that will be able to protect american trade and jefferson as secretary of state said that essentially he told congress we have three choices here if we want to protect trade in the mediterranean one is simply stop trading in the mediterranean if you don't want your ships captured stay out of the mediterranean where algiers or tripoli or tunis might capture you or we could pay tribute to Algiers and Tripoli and Tunis. I mean, they would capture these ships and then hope that either their home government or the families of the sailors or the owners of the ships would pay ransom. And Jefferson didn't think that was a good idea. He thought, as, as American minister to France, he thought that would simply encourage these countries to take more American ships. If you know you capture a ship, they're gonna send you 
a million dollars, well, you're gonna capture more ships. So first choice, stay out of the Mediterranean. Second choice, pay ransom. We know that neither one of these was appealing to Jefferson. The third is build a navy to protect American commerce. And that idea didn't really go anywhere initially until in 1793, Britain makes a treaty with Algiers, which allows Algerian ships to enter the Mediterranean. Long story, I think you mentioned the book I wrote about this, so I'm not going to give away everything in it. But Algiers captures about a dozen more American ships, and this forces Congress to take action. There's a big debate in Congress. Why don't we just pay Portugal, which already is patrolling the Straits of Gibraltar to keep Algiers out of the, out of the Atlantic? Or why don't we hire someone else? Or, you know, so Congress wasn't really eager to spend money then on a Navy, which is a big expensive thing. And one of the ironies here is that Jefferson, of course, was a Virginian. The Virginians were typically or against building a Navy. However, New England was in favor of it. But Jefferson really is an advocate for building a Navy, even though by 1793, he's left the administration. However, now Congress has to act, and what Congress does is decide to build six frigates, as we know, and one of them, of course, we're happy is still with us in Charlestown. So the Navy is built, and Constitution, no, but by, as the Navy is being built, Algiers makes peace with the Americans, and so did Tripoli and Tunis. So no longer a need for the Navy. Most of it is put on mothballs. And then um, by the late, uh, you know, France, though, has started capturing American merchant ships because the United States and Britain have made a treaty. I'm sorry, I don't mean to go through this step by step, but the story here is that you never have the same adversary and situations are going to change and keep changing and a Navy has to be able to adapt to these things. So you have France starting to capture American merchant ships and the uh, Constitution is finished in time to play a small role in the quasi war with France. And then just at the same moment when Thomas Jefferson becomes president, Tripoli declares war on the United States. And the war doesn't mean Tripoli is going to send a fleet to the United States or an army to the United States or necessarily the United States is going to send an army to Tripoli, but Tripoli will capture American merchant ships in the Mediterranean because now you're at war. So again, the Mediterranean is going to be closed and this happens at the same moment. Thomas Jefferson becomes president and he is determined to use the Navy against Tripoli, but use it in a way either to send the Navy to blockade Tripoli or, and by the Navy, we only have uh, maybe half a dozen or so ships in the Navy. So, or we will use our Navy to cooperate with other countries who also are at war with Tripoli, Sweden, any of the Italian states. So the Navy will be sent to Tripoli to blockade Tripoli, to engage in war if necessary, or to cooperate with other countries. And the Tripolitan War is something I could go on about. In fact, I have at the museum. The museum is always good enough to invite me to come and talk about Tripoli whenever I need to uh, find an audience. So um, you're using the Navy again strategically, and it's a great story, but that is really one of the great moments for Constitution, the war against Tripoli, in eight, which ends in 1805. And then, of course, the War of 1812, you remember the taglines for that war were free trade and sailors' rights. The impetus for the war was that, well, both England and France were capturing American merchant ships. Both England and France had blockaded Europe against the other. So the, the um, Americans had been trading with both. We were neutral. And the British said, you can't trade with France or in fact with continental Europe if you want to trade with us. And in fact, if we find you trading with them, we'll capture you on the high seas. France said the same thing. You can't trade with England if you also want to trade with continental Europe and we'll take your trade as an act of war. The United States said that neutral ships make neutral goods. The fact that we were neutral meant that our ship should be able to trade anywhere. It was an argument neither Britain or France was going to accept at the time. So our merchant ships were being captured by both. And this is the big thing precipitating the War of 1812, a war really fought for the idea of free trade, sailors' rights. And then the war ends, as we know, heroically with the Constitution. I should have mentioned the Guerriere and the um, Java and the Cyan and Levant, which are great stories in Constitution's lore, uh, as well as in the Navy's lore. And then when the war ends, so what happens next? Well, the Navy is still essential to protecting American commerce, even though the interest of the United States is turned more inward. 
but there still is a great deal of trade going on. In fact, in the early 1830s, a couple of ships in um, Sumatra at the port of Kuala Batu are gathering pepper, and they are captured, actually attacked by local pirates. You know, it's Java then and Sumatra um, did not have a, a centralized stable government that could prevent piracy, and piracy was a lucrative thing. So this pepper ship, the um, enterprise, I think, the friendship was actually attacked by, uh, from Salem, attacked in Kuala Batu. President Jackson then determines to get tough, and he sends the Potomac, an American warship, to Kuala Batu to find out who was responsible and to punish them, which they do. And they do make alliances with locals who are hostile to these pirates. And also, the sh it's showing the flag showing that if you attack one of our ships, we'll retaliate by sending another ship. Even though we have a relatively small Navy, we're able to deploy it in different places in a way to show our force. And at about the same time, the um, United States strikes up an alliance with um, Saeed bin Sultan Abu Sayyadi, who was the Sultan of Oman. And Oman stretched from Oman on the um, Arabian Peninsula to Zanzibar on the coast of Africa and an American ship, actually the Potomac, had run aground off of the Arabian Peninsula, and the Sultan sent his men to protect this ship and help restore it. This establishes a friendship. So, the United States is using its fleet kind of strategically because your choice is either to have a fleet that can you know, cover the entire world or Use, it, use effectively what you have. And this is really at a moment when the United States is emerging as a power with interests which are spanning the globe. Remember the 18 teens, the United States for the first time has a Pacific fleet or a fleet in the Pacific, even though at that time the United States was claiming the Oregon Territory but didn't have much else in, on, in the Pacific. And at the same time, also during the War of 1812, American warship went into the Indian Ocean. And so you have the American Navy following American trade, which was already in these places. American whalers were venturing into the Pacific. Merchants from New England were going to the Pacific Northwest and to China. And then whalers are going to, the, to Hawaii. So you have American merchants going around the world. And the Navy really follows as a way of protecting them. And constitutions World Cruise, which I'm actually writing a book about right now, is uh, a showing the flag around the world. When the Constitution arrived in China in the summer of 1845, initially Captain Percival thought we're going to stay just long enough to get fresh water and provisions. And in fact, one of the things it did that summer was deliver the first American flag to the new American consulate in Hong Kong, which also opened in 1845. So you see Constitution really following the merchant fleet, the Navy following the merchant fleet, protecting these sea lanes with this idea the Americans had, really we see it in the War of 1812, that free trade is the essential thing. So protecting the sea lanes for anyone who wants to trade, not simply looking out for the interests of American ships. So that, in a nutshell, is the development of the Navy, Constitution's role in it, and the Navy as an instrument for protecting maritime trade around the world. Wow. I think that um, that is a panorama of sort of global commerce that may be deeper and richer and older than a lot of the general public tend to imagine. Um, I think when the public thinks about uh, global commerce as a term and as something that they're benefiting from in local shops and stores, they think about it as being a more modern phenomenon uh, connected to the industrial rise of modern industrial rise of China. Uh, and to that end, Jim, I'm wondering if you can sort of bring us forward from the 1800s to today. And, and tell us, in, you know, the Navy does still have a presence in many of these places uh, and more that Bob was just talking about historically. Um, can we draw a line from the Constitution's role that Bob was just talking about to the Navy's presence today? Uh, and where is that particularly tight? I think people have been seeing headlines about increasing volatility in the South China Sea in particular but may not be fully aware of those those connections uh, if they're there. 
Hey, thanks, Carl. It's, it's wonderful to be with you all today. It's, it's a very different uh, from my last uh, event with the USS Constitution back in uh, 2015. Then it was different because we were at the museum. Now we are here, wherever here happens to be. For the <laughs> uh, then we had to come in and contend with mountains of snow burying the Navy Yard during that epic winter that February. Uh, now, not so much. Then, as Carl mentioned, we were looking back at Constitution's last battle, the bicentennial of the dual victory over HMS Cyan and Levant in 1815. Now, of course, we're looking ahead in the South China Sea and potentially in other important bodies of water around the periphery of Eurasia, which is where the action is at and I suspect will be at for many years to come. So, as far as drawing a direct line from the Constitution, I think you'll see that I draw more contrast than uh, than uh, likenesses out of the out of the out of the two experiences. But at the same time, looking at where Constitution has been points to where we may be going in the coming years and decades, because we're at the outset of a of a, of a, of a com very competitive era in maritime Asia. So that being said, let me get right to it. And to oversimplify, Constitution faced two types of threats to maritime commerce. Local nuisances, such as Carl mentioned, pirates or the Barbary states of North Africa, and great powers, such as France in the Quasi-War of 1798 to 1801, and Britain during the War of 1812. Today, increasingly, is more like the struggles against France and Britain. That's because great powers now pose the biggest threat to freedom of the sea. And their ambitions are an order of magnitude greater than French or British ambitions were back in those days. France and Britain mostly wanted to disrupt high style shipping in times of war and lay some economic hurt on their adversaries. Today's great powers, China, and I'm not gonna cover Russia, but uh, Russia, this is true to an extent of them as well. They want to own the seas that they hold dear. If allowed to get their way, they will permit use of these waters only on their terms and in wartime and peacetime alike. For example, today the Chinese Communist Party claims indisputable sovereignty throughout some 80 to 90% of the South China Sea. As any international relations student will tell you, sovereignty equates to public ownership. The sovereign government makes, excuse me, the sovereign government makes rules, expressing its will within territory it claims, and it uses physical force to compel those within the territory to obey the laws that it, that it lays down. So if China gets its way, it will make the rules governing what happens in waters it claims, including the South China Sea, and others will obey. Freedom to use the sea for military or diplomatic purposes will certainly suffer if Beijing gets its way. Freedom to use the sea for commerce could suffer as well if China sees fit to restrict it. But despite these breathtaking ambitions that we see, the, the, the threat looks rather innocuous when we see it on the news. And that's a feature for China, not a bug in the program. Coast Guard cutters, commercial vessels, and even fishing boats are the face of the threat. If you're tempted to laugh, don't. Sea power is, more, is about more than navies and more, more than about warships and naval fleets. States commonly, looking back through history, have used non-naval ships or today airplanes, shore-based systems to make geopolitical gains at sea during wartime and sometimes during peacetime as well. Three quick examples that you might be familiar with. In 1974, uh, for example, China boasted about the role that its maritime militia had played in a battle against South Vietnam's Navy. Maritime militia is an irregular force that operates within the Chinese fishing fleet. That battle, as you may have guessed, was over South China Sea Islands. That's the same force that you see active in the South China Sea today. So what we see in Southeast Asia constitutes part of a long-standing pattern of Chinese operations. Or secondly, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union used fishing trawlers packed with electronic snooping gear to keep an eye on US Navy carrier battle groups and service action groups. I've seen it with my own eyes. Soviet AGIs were such a fixture of the seascape in those days that US commanders would often assign them stations in our formations so that they wouldn't get in the way when we maneuvered. In a sense, they were unofficial parts of our fleet. Or thirdly, here's a fun one, a literary reference. During World War II, novelist Ernest Hemingway hunted German U-boats in the Caribbean Sea in the 1942 timeframe, turning his fishing boat Pilar into an unofficial auxiliary warship. Fortunately for Hemingway, he didn't catch any steel submarines in his wooden hulled yacht, but he went out <laughs> hunting them. So how does this strategy work? What China does in the South China Sea today and elsewhere, elsewhere around the periphery is to act as though its complaints to disputed territory are already fact and it enforces its laws. 
the fishing fleet goes into disputed waters and does what fishing fleets do. Commercial vessels uh, survey for oil or gas under the seafloor and so on. If anyone tries to interfere, interfere, the China Coast Guard treats them as lawbreakers intruding on Chinese territory, even though the, the international law of the sea allots these waters to China's neighbors to harvest natural resources of their own. So in effect, Beijing dares its neighbors to try to chase off its commercial fleet and Coast Guard. If they can't, and they generally can't, it is left holding the disputed waters. China wins. If a Southeast Asian Coast Guard or Navy tries to use force, it looks like the aggressor and China can then justify using force to defeat it. China wins again. In short, China's, uh, China's strategy presents the victim with a no-win situation and paints the victim as a criminal and a potential bully. Let me repeat, China's military is most, mostly invisible in this scheme of things. Uh, People's Liberation Army sea, air, and missile forces wait in reserve somewhat, somewhere over the, over the horizon. It doesn't, look like a, it doesn't look like China's bullying anybody. But, and yet, at the same time, overpowering military force gives Beijing the option to escalate a dispute. It can enforce its will where the Philippines, Vietnam, or Malaysia cannot. This puts Southeast Asians in a tough situation while making it hard for the United States or other outside powers to help them defend their, their rights to territory and resources. Short of creating a multinational version of Thomas Jefferson's Mediterranean Squadron, the standing, in force, standing force in which USS Constitution served, it's hard to see how the region can face down China's peacetime encroachment. So there's a dark note out of uh, USS Constitution history that we can play with uh, during the Q&A. Speaking of China's military, let, let me turn to the military and naval dimensions of the problem for the balance of my time with you. The strategic problem gets even harder than I've already indicated. We might find ourselves in a fight in Southeast Asia. Lord Horatio Nelson, who was commanding Royal Navy fleets when USS Constitution was still a frontline warship, once joked that a ship's a fool to fight a fort. What he meant was that shore-based firepower, the guns of a coastal fortress, holds the advantage over the strongest naval fleet if that fleet comes within reach. Lord Nelson would recoil in terror if he saw how forts have proliferated along Eurasian coastline since his day. Think about it. Old Ironsides had it relatively easy by contrast with today. The range of gunnery was minuscule in those days. Gun engagements took place at, or took place at uh, ranges measured in hundreds of yards. That meant navies could usually bypass shore fortifications. Today's artillery spans scores or hundreds of miles. For example, China's DF-26 anti-ship ballistic missile can reportedly strike at moving ships at sea some 2,000 miles away. That's comparable to firing missiles from the Charlestown Navy Yard next to USS Constitution against ships off the Yucatan Peninsula or the southern tip of Greenland. And that leaves aside China's Navy and Air Force, which of course uh, boast formidable combat power of their own. But there's still more. Forts are now mobile, unlike in the age of sail. Chinese missiles are mostly mounted on trucks. That means China could spread out sentries along its coastal perimeter to, prov to provide sentry duty, or it could concentrate them to mass firepower near some scene of action, say against Taiwan or against, uh, against some adversary in the South China Sea. It can, always, it can also move these missile batteries to evade counterattack. This is a flexible capability and extremely hard to root out. During Desert Storm 30, 30 years ago, coalition air forces hunted for Iraqi Scud missile launchers in the Western de Desert. Best I know, we did not take out a single battery. Furthermore, there's, and there's even more. China can locate its movable forts deep inland while still reaching out far to sea. For example, Taiwan's west coast is only about 100 miles off the mainland shores. Keeping missiles in the backcountry dares China's opponents to strike at them and to be seen as attacking deep into the Chinese homeland. Again, China would cast itself as the aggrieved party in the dispute. Beijing believes we would balk at striking inland. If we do, we, we will permit PLA rocket forces a safe haven to pound away against our forces and our allies. So there's the problem. How should we deal with this problem? Well, let me make a few suggestions that we can bat around during our time together today. First of all, and I, I would say first and foremost, by cultivating a culture of badassery. In the tradition of Constitution Captain Charles Stewart, who in 1815 turned his sails into brakes like Maverick against the Soviet MiGs and Top Gun. 
Stewart backed the frigate sails to stop the ship, and the British enemy flew right by. Letting Constitution engage the British ships one by one from a position of advantage, rather than at the same time from a position of disadvantage. We need to rediscover Captain Stewart's brand of enterprise and unorthodoxy. After all, competing successfully in, in the final analysis is about human excellence. Secondly, we, we can compete by going small and numerous when configuring our future fleet. We Navy people, we love big, glitzy, pricey warships bristling with sensors and armaments. But they're vulnerable, and we cannot afford many because they are so pricey. So U.S. Navy and Marine leaders now want to add swarms of light, cheap warships that pack a punch. We could lose one or a few of them, but the fleet as a whole would fight on. A fleet that can take a heavy hit and keep going is a resilient fleet, and a resilient fleet is ultimately a winning fleet. Thirdly, Navy and Marine leaders are talking about distributing firepower throughout the fleet as it currently exists. Good thing about the existing fleet, you can bolt anti-ship missiles onto most any hull, including even an amphibious transport or even an oiler or a supply ship of some sort. This is a throwback to the days of USS Constitution when merchant ships typically carried big guns for self-defense. If we make every ship a fighting ship, we make ourselves even more resilient while multiplying the challenges confronting our adversaries. Fourthly, by extending our range, our fleet's range relative to Fortress China and China's Navy, we have started getting a handle on all the problems that I have cataloged. Over the past five years, we have made uh, substantial progress in, uh, in engineering. For example, Pentagon engineers have repurposed the SM-6 surface-to-air missile, an extremely, extremely capable missile, to conduct long-range engagements against enemy surface ships. We have developed a new long-range anti-ship missile and deployed it from U.S. Air Force bombers and also from Navy carrier warplanes. We have reinvented an anti-ship version of the Tomahawk cruise missile, a very long-range weapon that existed in my day in uniform and was foolishly retired after the Cold War. These things are not in the fleet in large numbers yet, but they are coming. All is not lost, despite the dark picture that I painted for you in the last few minutes. And lastly, we can compete successfully by integrating the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard efforts and forces much more tightly than ever before. If we keep our Asian alliances and partnerships solid, we can make geography our ally. After all, American allies and friends own prime real estate in the region. That could let us stand in within hostile weapons range, using Pacific Islands as temporary bases, despite all the Chinese advantages that I have cataloged for you. Navy ships can land Marines equipped with anti-ship and anti-air missiles on the islands. They can give hostile aircraft and ships a very bad day and then scoot away to avoid counterattack, and then they can go on to make trouble for China elsewhere. So in a sense, we can remind our opponents that their ships and planes are also fools to fight forts. So the ghost of the ghost of Nelson, I think, would smile at this, at this uh, approach that I have uh, laid out for you. So in the end, USS Constitution's career is a valuable sounding board, not because our high-tech age is like the age of sail, but because the contrast between then and now is so drastic. History shows where we have come from over the past two centuries, and it gives us clues to how to get where we want to go in the future. Thank you for your attention. Wow, thanks, Jim. I appreciate that. This is um, a fascinating look at sort of the balance of something that both you two talked about. Um, we're looking at uh, great powers, fighting, and state actors, um, threats not only to uh, commerce on, on the seas, but battles over um, rights to ocean waters and everything in them and under them as well, too as Jim was pointing out, and all of the implications that has, and how as a naval strategy and maritime strategy, we're gonna to start to grapple with that. Uh, yet I wanna to go to Rocky to talk a little bit about the merchant's perspective on this, sailing through all of these volatile situations and waters for 200 years have been merchants who were in some cases Americans or not, of bringing trade in and out of the United States. Um, Reggie, how, how, have the, how has the merchant situation on the nation's waters changed? And hearing Jim's uh, sort of uh, kind of dire prognosis of the situation um, and, and the way forward uh, in his mind from a naval strategy, where, do, where, do, uh, where does maritime commerce stand from a maritime security standpoint today? 
Great. Uh, thank you, Carl. And first of all, it's, it's really an honor to follow these two giants um, in, uh, in thought leadership from history and maritime strategy. So uh, thank you for having me. And uh, I'll, I'll touch on a few things. I think I, I view the U.S. Constitution as a great way of educating our younger generations in the history of the United States and our allies' connections to the ocean. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to frame a few things at a grand scale, and then I'll get into the nuts and bolts of the shipping side. So I think that um, there are a few constants from the early 19th century to current time. One is geography matters. And so the United States, is, as the, the, the most powerful of the great powers, also has in many ways the, the best geography because we have these two great oceans um, we have relatively weak neighbors, um, and we have uh, orchestrated since the end of World War II a relatively open free trade system, mostly with allies, and that has given us um, a lot of advantages to secure our imports and exports, and that our economy is relying on those, and I think that, you know, another piece of why the U.S. S. Constitution's mission to 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 tell the story of the US Navy, to tell the story of, of our, our relationship with the ocean, is that we have started to forget this as just a general population. We have 330 million people, and at this stage, how many of them crossed an ocean in a liner ship? Very small portion. Um, and I think that uh, I'm originally from the great state of Idaho, the great maritime state of Idaho, and uh, it's a flyover state, and the oceans have become a flyover territory. And so we don't really, I think the average person doesn't appreciate the great scale of the oceans unless they're in one of the sea services or they work in the cruise industry or something, but it's not a large segment of society like it used to be even 50 years ago. Um, and so I think that's something that, that the public education piece of this is a really key piece because we're very reliant on, on global trade and, and a few statistics here. So getting a little bit more into shipping, 90% uh, of global trade by, by weight is transported by sea. Um, much of this is bulk commodities, things like iron ore, uh, coal, oil, crude oil, liquefied natural gas, uh, all the agricultural products that are transported around the world, wheat, corn, et cetera. Um, these are things that we take for granted. And uh, as, uh, as Greeks, Greek ship owners often joke, God must have been a ship owner because he put so much of the goods far away from the population centers. So we're reliant on these flows. And I think that uh, I look at these trade flows have been largely stable since the end of World War II. But I think uh, 2020, more than any year, uh, illustrates that these things can be changed for all kinds of different reasons, including even pandemic lockdowns. Um, and you, so much of global, global shipping flows are covered by uh, private companies, and so they're proprietary. You never really know exactly how resilient a supply chain is or how vulnerable you are um, until it's disrupted. It's typically disrupted by, uh, by a hot war. Um, and so the fact that it was so disrupted in just, just the last few months uh, due to non-war issues, actually, I think is an interesting wake-up call for the population, and and I think a real opportunity to pull to to reshore some of our our really important things like pharmaceutical drugs and things that we should have here, and maybe other things, rare earth metals and stuff like that. And I think that there is an opportunity, and I'm not sure um, we're going to have an intelligent political debate in kind of these polarized times nationally, but we could have a thoughtful debate saying, okay this pause in global trade, although temporary, because it's largely recovered, um, illustrated a lot of vulnerabilities that, that we're certainly capable of taking care of. And I think it's in our interest. And I think that's a really interesting aspect of this. Um, and so the, the importance of global shipping remains, remains a fact. I think that that's gonna, that's gonna remain an important issue. I think certain trade patterns will change. Um, the, other, the other difference between the early 19th century and even the early 20th century and today is that we are an increasingly multipolar world, um, but this time most of the major great powers either have nuclear weapons or are certainly nuclear capable, such as Japan or Germany, be 
days or weeks for them to, to develop those weapons. And that that means that hot, hot wars are, there's a suppression factor there and it's unclear whether that, um, that remains in effect in places like the South China Sea where there's a lot of nationalistic uh, uh, feelings over the maritime waters by China and others in that region. And so um, all of a sudden it becomes very complicated. Now, I would say that American mariners uh, from uh, the 18th century to the present have been risk takers and they've been out um, and really in many ways now because of the, uh, the global reach of the US Navy and, and Coast Guard and other sea services that in many ways today is much more secure and even uh, although there's areas of conflict like the South China Sea or parts of the Eastern Mediterranean or the Arctic, most of the world ocean is largely secure except for you have sort of minor uh, non-state actor threats. Um, you know, really on the grand scale of global trade, the piracy issues, although it gets a lot of headlines, is not a, it's not a major factor in disrupting trade. And so I think all of those sorts of things uh, make this a super interesting topical area to think about because there's lots of different players um, and the, the post-World War II global shipping industry is quintessentially international. And I'll talk a little bit about something called open registries. So historically, uh, the jurisdiction over a commercial vessel was determined by the flag that it flew. Um, and so, and it still is that case today. Um, and so if it's a US flagged ship, then, then the sovereignty of that commercial vessel and what is regulating that commercial vessel in international waters is that flag state's laws. Now, after World War II, as the, as, the, as the global economy, particularly among Western countries, became much more liberalized, you had the fall, the fall of different colonial trading systems, it became very much a, uh, a, a different system than we had historically, where, um, and, and there's interesting history here I won't get into, but uh, certain flags rose to prominence, such as Panama and Liberia. Um, and so, and they're at this stage in 2020, mostly there for, for tax reasons and regulatory reasons. And so it's not uncommon um, that you have a Greek owned vessel that's flagged in Panama, insured in London and carrying goods between the United States and Japan and crewed by Ukrainians, right? And this is just how the maritime industry works. Um, so, and that's how it has operated since the end of World War II. Now, because of that, it has been one of the more opaque industries um, in, in, that, in that last 75 years. Now, what has changed, I would say in the last 20 years, is we have a proliferation of satellite technologies, of um, much more tracking and transparency. This was really boosted up, uh, particularly after 9-11. Um, and so this, uh, this core international industry that's the lifeblood of, of the globalized economy is now under scrutiny from, from satellite networks, from uh, aerial surveillance, and much more coordination. I mean, I think that as I was thinking about this topic, the other big thing that has changed, of course, since um, the USS Constitution was, was uh, fighting the Barbary Wars is that news passes so fast. And so we know if a, if a, if a US merchant ship is attacked in the Strait of Hormuz, we know it in minutes. Right, and that, and that is a difference um, from what we had historically. Um, and because we have a global reach, and because, the, uh, as, as Jim mentioned, the reach of modern naval uh, capability uh, and firepower, whether it's uh, ship-based missiles, aircraft, um, the, the reach of these systems is so great that you can have a real global presence on the key, the key uh, commercial trade routes um, and with, without as many ships as you would think you would need with such a great geography. Um, and the other, the other last thing I'll just mention is that um, at this stage, and we'll see what happens over the next uh, decade or so, but at this stage, the U.S. is still presiding over uh, a, a, a strong set of alliances, uh, whether it's NATO in the North Atlantic, uh, it's very close relationships with all its different Pacific allies, uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, uh, increasing uh, coordinated uh, efforts between India, Japan, Australia, and the United States. So bringing the Indian Ocean into the mix. And I think that, um, as I tell my graduate students studying international affairs, uh, 2020 is by far the most interesting time to think about global trade, 
global affairs, um, global naval competition, um, since our, certainly the Fletcher School was founded in 1933. And I think that all these different factors are, are, are increasing the complexity of the global trade situation. And because of uh, the, uh, the increased lethality um, and also the, the rise of autonomous vehicles, both aerial and surface um, and underwater vehicles, that there's the pace of technological change, the pace of, uh, of different uh, commercial relationships that are changing and evolving, uh, makes this a potentially unstable situation, um, but it, it potentially can be managed and mitigated. The risks can be mitigated if we um, think about how we structure our alliances and set, and set norms of behavior um, and try to create incentives for stability. So uh, uh, it's a great topical area because I would say that um, the U.S. Navy and its global presence is as important as ever uh, for, the, for the U.S. economy. Um, and how we, uh, how we navigate the next 10, 20 years, I think will, uh, will really shape um, kind of how the century unfolds. And I'll, I'll close on this last point because uh, looking at the last 75 years of history, the great changes in both global commerce, but also international affairs tends to happen in very compressed time periods. So um, between 1945 and 1949, there were lots of changes that happened. You had uh, essentially the, the new US-led international order was, was set up. You had NATO, um, the Bretton Woods systems all set up. And then at, after the end of the Cold War, from 1991 to 1996, you had lots of other changes um, that took place. The WTO took place. You had, um, you had kind of new appreciation for climate change with the Rio Declaration and in 1992 and, and, and regional trade blocks like NAFTA in 1993. We had also a spurt of, of changes after 9-11, uh, after but really that was from maybe 2001 to 2004. But since 2005, you know, the last 15 years have been largely stable and it's been sort of slow changes. But I just think that uh, the, the disruption that COVID has done to the global economy and the, the really, um, uh, uncovering of supply chains and some of their weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Um, there's going to be a lot of change, my prediction, from, from 2020 to 2025. And so this five-year period, I, it will be a, uh, a time where uh, decisions made between uh, countries with shared interests and, and competitor great powers, I think will shape potentially the next 25, 30 years. So that should give a, a lot of different things for us to discuss in the Q&A. Yeah, it definitely does. In fact, we've already had a couple of questions coming in from viewers that are focused kind of along the lines of what you were just talking about, Rocky. And I want to take a minute to sort of address this broader theme, um, particularly as it both relates to the South China Sea and the conflicts today, as well as what a kind of different landscape it is from the one that Constitution was sailing in. Uh, and that, of course, is the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, we've had a couple uh, viewers already, attendees, asking uh, about the value in this conflict of the U.S. Uh, ratifying UNCLOS uh, and what that could mean and uh, in terms of both commerce, uh, but also in terms of providing a leverage point and a seat at the table to begin to address some of the issues that, that Jim is talking about. Um, Rocky, I'll bounce back to you from, from the shipper's standpoint. Uh, how fundamental is that ratification? Is our presence there matter or, or not? So I think, I think it would be marginally helpful to get it ratified. I know uh, my sort of joke to my students is if it weren't named the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, it would already be ratified. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, branding matters, uh, I guess, is the key takeaway from that. Um, and, but it's going to be a heavy lift to get certain skeptical um, kind of uh, uh, certain senators, and particularly in kind of the interior of the United States, to approve that. And, and I'm not sure it's I, – I think that – it is often used, uh, used actually pretty um, adroitly by the Chinese and others to kind of just make us look bad. But as a matter of practical reality, we, we, we follow that. We basically view that as customary law. And so it's, 
it's, uh, it's, we treat that as the existing law, even though we haven't ratified the treaty. Um, and so it, there would be a marginal benefit, I think, to being at the table and having it be ratified and, and, uh, and may enhance our cooperation with our, our NATO allies and Pacific allies to look at it. But, but I would say this, and, and maybe it's just the sort of realist in me, um, I think international law is a great guide during peacetime. Um, and what it does is it, it uh, shapes nation state behavior uh, by creating a diplomatic penalty for violating international law. But in, a, but in an open conflict, uh, international law typically goes out the window. And, and I think um, I'm not the first person to talk about, you know, it was against international law to, uh, to, 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 to fire um, your torpedoes from a submarine against a commercial vessel without, without surfacing um, on uh, December 6th, 1941. Uh, but on uh, December 8th, 1941, um, that went out the window. <laughs> it was sink anything you can um, after Pearl Harbor. And so I think that uh, there's a big difference when it's, a, when it's a hot conflict versus peacetime. Now, we haven't had a major hot conflict between great powers since World War II. And so, you know, international law is important and, and it, it's a good guide. Uh, but I think that, um, I think that, I would describe it as a nice to have um, to, to ratify the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, but what we can still move forward with that framework. And actually, um, I think another important piece of this, and it'll be uh, interesting to see how this plays out over the next couple of years, is that the, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea is, is, being, is being updated uh, globally. The UN's really focusing on looking at other aspects of uh, the high seas, and how to improve it, and there and there may be a way to actually get it through the Senate. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Um, but it also is going to start to cover some of the things like biodiversity and and how we preserve the 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 uh, the, uh, the the fisheries capacity globally, and and all the other things that uh, because of technolo technological pro progress since the 1980s, all of a sudden there's a lot more interest in updating that that bo that body of uh, international law. My Jim. Turn. I might add a couple of things. Could I add a, there's, there's just, it's a standard, and I'm sure you've seen it a lot, Rocky. It's a standard question. It always comes up in any South China Sea uh, event or anything really involving freedom of the sea. Two, two things I always say. One, it's, it's, it's kind of, and this goes back to what you were saying about uh, getting it through the Senate. It's a strange situation because you have the biggest spoiler of, of, of the international law of the sea within the system. China, China is a charter member of it, as is the uh, Soviet Union and then Russia. And the biggest enforcer of it, which is ourselves, standing apparently outside the system. Would the system actually be enforced if the U.S. Navy did it in concert with our allies? Uh, chances are no. But it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird situation. And that's the way I, I always encourage people to think about it. I don't have any answers as to what the correct way is, but it just feels weird. Which goes to the second point I was just going to make. The politics of it is... Whenever it's you mentioned the Chinese, but really even our allies in Europe or Australia or whatever, they they'll usually bring up this question as a gotcha line. Hey, you, you know why you're not in the system? Blah blah blah. And I always say I always say what you did. Yes, it's customary law. Customary law is a very valid source of international law. But at the same at the same time, if uh, if China if somebody else can hold up a piece of paper and says here's a written body of law, that just but that just gives that to, that just gives a person who makes that case a political advantage because customary law is just it's just sort of vague and most people don't study the history of uh, jurisprudence and so forth. So, yeah, I, I think it, I think just for those reasons, it would be good for us to finally sign on to the accord. But uh, yeah, I guess we'll find, see whether it has a constituency if you if things are changing as drastically as you as you say they are. Thanks, and Jim. Um, one of our other questions from a attendee regarding that was whether or not uh, the U.S. seems to unclose would strengthen the legal regime to hold China in check. Uh, when it's asserting sovereignty, is is there, regardless of the politics and the gotchas, uh, is there any is there any really uh, valid you know strength to it? Rocky says that uh, it works in peacetime, but when you get into a hot war, it's not so effective. As things are are starting to heat up, and we're looking at the kinds of you know turning toward the kinds of uh, uh, I think you called it badassery strategies. Um, where does that fit into, uh, you know, to, to this? You know, I think it is, by you're not going to get to, I'm a Fletcher guy and so is Rocky, you're not going to get us to say that international law is, in fact, yeah, in fact I'm putting you on report because you, you seem to downplay <laughs> international law. 
Well, no, I think it, no, I think it is actually that you, I mean, you're talking about enforcement. It's very valuable from a political standpoint because it does give us a body of law to rally ourselves around with our, our Japanese friends, South Korea, South Korea, Philippines, whoever. I mean, that gives a, that gives us a way to rally these nations as they see China. China is actually our best friend in a sense from a coalition building standpoint because it's really uh, over since 2009 when it when it uh, when it issued the nine dash line map saying this belongs to us. This is indisputable sovereignty. That's uh, well, I mean, that's uh, that's setting itself against the rest of Asia. We're always uh, another hardy perennial question that comes up in China discussions is just, uh, you know, it's comparing alliances and coalitions. Well, if you look at China's, if you look at China's uh, roster of allies as opposed to our own, it's uh, our, our, our bench is pretty deep and theirs is pretty, uh, it's pretty shallow. Who is it? North Korea, Pakistan, they're, stri they're apparently striking up some sort of arrangement with Iran, so that would help them a bit. But we've got Japan, second, third largest economy in the world, South Korea, very impressive, yada, 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 as well as all the, as well as the geographic fact that all these nations are around the Chinese periphery and, and can have basically help us uh, continue. If we, if we decide to, 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 to go the containment route, as we did back in the 1950s, that's, that's an asset as well. So there's only, so the legal stuff really, the, the international law always blurs into the questions of politics and strategy. It's kind of an interesting thing compared to domestic law, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's, so yes, I think it's useful. No, it's not a silver bullet, but, uh, but I think it's very helpful for us to rally uh, opposition to this sort of encroachment on freedom of the sea. So I, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the alliances that you brought up, but for um, attendees who may not be as familiar with what we're bouncing back and forth, um, the nature of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea sets limits on sovereignty over uh, ocean waters, um, and I'm simplifying rightly here, but it sets a series of steps outward from the shoreline of which you have as a nation state um, a variety of rights uh, over not only what the conduct that's conducted on the surface of those waters in terms of ships passing through, but your rights to what's actually in the water column, largely in terms of fishing, uh, and rights to um, mineral and mining uh, on the on the sea floor. Um, Bob, I want to bounce back to you for a second to bring this back to a little bit of historical perspective as we're in this sort of peacetime thing, talking about all of these various sovereignty and rights, it seems like it comes back to a little bit of what you were echoing with constitution and historically, particularly in, in Southeast Asia before. Does this sound familiar, this regime and these issues, or is, is that battle over sovereignty of the world's oceans totally different today from, from what constitution was facing when she was in these same waters in the 1830s and 40s? Well, at the risk of sounding really equivocal, I'll say yes, it is and it isn't. Um, <laughs> I, I think the thing to remember, of course, is when Constitution was built, there were two great powers in the world, the France and England, and the United States really wasn't prepared to compete with either one. And so for that, there's a lesson there. I mean, we were, as uh, one of the other speakers mentioned, really blessed with this geography and tremendous natural resources with which we're able to build ships like Constitution. You know, as well as in New England, really skilled shipbuilders. I mean, we have the resources to build a ship and the parts of Constitution come from all across the country. And then we didn't know that we also had oil and uh, coal and these other resources as well. Um, so the United States does become a great power, but then as um, Jim and Rocky have reminded us, there are other countries emerging as great powers. And so we are in this contest with them and will always be. I think the United States had been in this competition um, early on. I mean, someone like John Adams always saw the United States as a great power, even when the United States wasn't. But uh, perhaps it's a state of mind that you need in order to carry yourself in a way, the way the Chinese have been doing for the last 30 years, really willing themselves uh, with some disastrous things before that, like the Great Leap Forward and other attempts by China to become the great power that China had been. You know, remember the thing that sets the entire colonial gambit in motion back in the 1400s were the goods of China that the Europeans wanted. And it's a quest for these sea routes to get to Asia that really sends Portugal around Africa and the Spanish across the Atlantic. And then, of course, the British and the French and the Dutch um, competing with them. 
So you have, yeah, yeah, this is, again, I, I apologize, I'm beginning a 50 minute lecture on the world, on world history since 1500. Um, and I should have just left it at, yes, Carl, it is very much the same, <laughs> and no, but no, it's also quite different. Well, I think you do raise an interesting point, though, you know, that, um, again, I'm not sure the, the sort of, you know, average general public uh, thinks about when they think about the rise of China, that this isn't so much a new phenomenon as back to the good old days um, of the 1400s. Yes, um, it is. In that regard. It is. And, you know, I think China, China, by the way, China has a great grasp of history uh, and understands that, uh, you know, in fact, Near 1750, there were more books printed in Chinese than in all the other languages combined. And most of those books were books of history uh, and the history of China, which is, so it was the central kingdom. And everyone else was a barbarian. And, uh, and so everyone comes to China. In 1789, the English tried to send an ambassador to make a treaty with China. And of course, he couldn't. And the China had no interest in a treaty with anyone else. And it was only the Opium War that forced China into her first treaty with a foreign power. And that was after the English were determined to sell opium in China. And again, uh, opium was illegal in China. And the English, the Americans, the French were importing it. And the Chinese government was debating, should we legalize this or should we ban it? And of course, the English anticipated the smart thing for China to do is legalize it because everyone can make a lot of money off of it. Much to their surprise, China banned it and then tried to enforce this. And this is what provokes the English into the war. And then in the wake of that, the United States was able to make its treaty with China. And then the French followed. You know, so, but China, uh, and again, it's the China became a cautionary tale, of course, for Japan, which saw what had happened in China and wanted to avoid that. So Japan takes a different course. Japan had closed herself off to the rest of the world in 1600. Uh, in the 1600s and actually was able to enforce Japan, Japanese insularity for a couple of hundred years. And Japan sees we can become like China, carved up by everyone else, or we can you know, create something different, which they did. And of course, um, it's a problem, sometimes difficult for us to remember that uh, 70 years ago, we did go to war with Japan. In fact, when Franklin Roosevelt took office in 1933, the first month, he said, we're probably going to go to war with Japan by the end of the decade. So both of these powers vying for, um, you know, their dominance in Asia. And so this, again, I apologize, I am rambling on about history. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm glad I'm able to talk because as Jim and Rocky have been talking about what's happening now and what might happen. I always tell my students that we historians sometimes can tell you what did happen. But when we start telling you what will happen, you should turn and run and Go talk to someone like Jim Araki, who has a better grasp of the future. Uh -huh. Those are, there's actually a couple of it, a couple of historical episodes that I think help us. And, and I, I agree with, with everything that Bob said. But there's good, when you when you look at sometimes it's harder for us here in the West to, to understand why China gets so strident about uh, naval affairs and about the sea. You you alluded to the Opium Wars and all. I mean that's a, that when when you hear the Chinese talk about it, as they do every day about the century of humiliation, they're talking about the Opium Wars up to the founding of the PRC in 1949. That's the history I think that is relatively familiar to people. But if you go back, you, you also mentioned the 15th century briefly for a, for a space of about three decades. China I think, under the Ming Dynasty had the biggest, the most technologically advanced, the most impressive navy in the entire world. Uh, which under Admiral Zheng He undertook a series of voyages around the in, in Southeast Asia, the South China Sea, and into the Indian Ocean. Depending on who you believe, they came to Newport, Rhode Island, and built the stone tower right here. I don't think they actually made it that far, but they but they almost certainly made it to the Persian Gulf and to the east coast of Africa. So that's a that's a point of pride with China. I mean, it's trying to get its mojo back after being a non naval power for a, a century, a, a series of centuries. So there's that sort of that, sort of that pride factor, and then there's also the humiliation factor. When you put those things together, I mean, that's a, that's a real propellant for Chinese maritime strategy and foreign policy. So it's fascinating history, and I think it's also a living thing. So it's, and I think it does I think it does help us point our point. point to the way to China's future and our own. Frankie, any other thoughts from you on No, I agree with that. I mean, I think that I think that uh, history needs to be our guide here, and uh, and I definitely don't feel I can predict the future. I could say it's gonna. I'll predict that it'll be very interesting <laughs> over the next few years, but I don't know which way it's gonna go. I I think it's. Uh, I do think I like to. Um, 
I like to encourage people to try to put themselves in, in a country's shoes. So, so, you know, we shouldn't forget that China, of course, has 14 different neighbors. Um, and it's, uh, its neighbors are a lot more threatening than, than our neighbors are. I mean, if, uh, if, if Mexico were India, nuclear-armed India, I think we'd feel differently about it, right? And, and, if, uh, and if Canada were nuclear-armed Russia, I'm pretty sure we'd feel differently. And so I think that, you know, they're, they're in a tough neighborhood. Um, there's a lot of nationalism and pride uh, grounded through centuries of history. Um, and they also have uh, modern geostrategic reasons to, uh, to boost their connections to where they rely on energy. So they, they extract a lot of energy from the uh, Gulf region, much more than we do now. Um, and it's not surprising uh, in many ways, if you try to put yourself in their shoes, that their first truly overseas base is in Djibouti. Um, and so I think what's going to be interesting is where is how India responds to that. And we're already seeing that um, uh, over the last few years, almost accelerated recently because of the recent uh, border dispute. Um, and so we'll see we'll see how India, which of course dominates the Indian Ocean Basin from a geography perspective, responds to that and, and how it builds its own relationship, continues to build a relationship with the United States and Australia and Japan in addition to its historic relations with Russia and Vietnam. Um, it's uh, it's the, the Indo-Pacific is going to be, um, I think, um, and again, it's just a, it's a soft prediction, but I think that's going to be where a lot of the action is as far as competition. It's already, and this is just a fact, it's actually where most of the global trade flows are. The inter-Asian uh, maritime trade uh, really dominates. And uh, a fact I like to tell my students is that trans-Pacific trade by volume exceeded transatlantic trade in the mid-80s. And that surprises a lot of people. Um, and so I think that uh, you know the, there's a lot of action commercially in the Pacific. There's increasing action um, in the Indian Ocean Basin. So the Indo-Pacific becomes really important. And, and where is the key link between the Indian Ocean economies and the Pacific economies? Oh, the South China Sea. <laughs> Malacca Strait, Singapore Strait, where we started, right? And so all of a sudden, when you start to put that global picture together, you realize that the focal point for the competition of how you control those critical, critical commodities flows that fuel not only the, the economy of China from an import perspective, but also, of course, Japan and South Korea, uh, strong U.S. allies, then you, you see how uh, and I love the uh, the badassery strategy. I think it's actually effective in the sense that if the if the if the alliance if the partnerships of the Quad nations, so India, United States, Japan, and Australia, um, and South Korea having a relationship bilaterally with the United States, that's a pretty powerful alliance. And and even Vietnam, for relatively small powers, pretty uh, it's pretty capable for its size. And I think that the it it. It creates, an, it creates a series of partnerships that, uh, that complicates China's ambitions to that nine dash line that Jim mentioned. Uh, Rocky, you bring up a couple points that actually echo to conversations that have been going on among our attendees and questions they had, uh, particularly um, uh, asking about the role that the Quad has to play. Uh, but then um, in terms of those treaties and alliances that we've all been talking about here so far, um, another attendee was asking, does a, uh, ASEAN have any credible military agreements or blocks uh, that can organize against the resistance or at least slow down uh, the PRC's designs? No. Uh, Jim, I'll turn to you <laughs> on that one. Oh, I'm sorry, that was my, that was my interjection. <laughs> oh, I, oh, no. Oh, <laughs> no, well, I mean, ASEAN's not designed to be a military alliance. It's, I mean, it's just, it just doesn't have the capability to do it. China, China has a couple of the countries. Basic, I mean, I'm, I'm being undiplomatic. Basically, in its back pocket. I mean, it's a, if it, it's a, it operates by consensus. I mean, therefore, if, if China has a guaranteed vote on, in its favor, then they're, they're just not going to accomplish a lot. Which is why they have been very, uh, very quiet about. So very quiet about this. I, uh, I've actually had the the pleasure of doing some quad activities, including over in India. Over in India, and uh, I think that's actually a much more promising arrangement. If you look at that roster of people, I mean, the, the Royal Australian Navy is a pretty is a very serious force. The Indian Navy 
going to be a serious force at some point. Look, at, I mean, if we, we talked about China's geographic advantages in the China Seas, east of the east of the Malay barrier, if you go to the west, those things work against China and in favor of India, which ha, which is the home team at that point, has the interior lines, as army people like to say, and uh, has a lot of advantages that way. So I, I put a lot, I put a lot of a lot more credence in that exterior presence. Uh, potential coalition than I would in in ASEAN's favor. So uh, we do have. I will. I will tell you. Actually, here's a, here's sort of a funny thing. You could tell. You could tell how much the world has changed over the last decade or so just by looking at my email inbox. Uh, and up until about 2012, when uh, uh, when when uh, President Xi, when when Chairman Xi came in, I heard uh, I heard from Chinese people. My basically my my contemporaries in China almost almost on a daily basis, and we kept uh, and we uh, were on very friendly terms. We would bat ideas around. That that started doing this almost instantly. I mean, it was almost like a funnel, a bottleneck, a bottleneck. But I never hear him from them anymore. I'm now in touch with my contemporaries in Vietnam on a day on a daily basis, and they're always asking, "What should we do about this?" Yada yada yada. So it's. I think that gives you a sense of how the world is how the world has changed in, in Southeast Asia and Asia Asia writ large. Wow, interesting. Uh, other thoughts from the other two? We'll move on to another topic and question. Huh? So uh, I'll, I'll throw one more thing in here, Carl, that I think is an intriguing concept, which is um, as as the fisheries in particular really become further strained, and they're already very strained. Uh, that could be a, a, a real hot point. Um, and I think that that's something we need to just bear in mind because uh, that reliance on that form of, of protein uh, for China and also its neighbors, um, I think shouldn't be underestimated. Um, and that, that could be, um, I, think it, I, I, I think they have the, um, uh, Jim appropriately framed it like they have their maritime militia of, of, of fishing vessels and, and other commercial vessels and they also have now the world's largest coast guard um and i think that's a real interesting development and that and they've built that coast guard essentially to become the number one by by number of vessels in the last five years um and i think that we need to think about what that means uh from a u.s perspective uh the japanese have already started building up their coast guard um, and I think that from a from a kind of similar to what we were talking about with the law of the sea, where it's a it's kind of just a gotcha um, that can be used diplomatically um, against the United States when uh, when we're sailing our gray hall vessels through the South China Sea and they're either responding with their with their maritime militia of fishing vessels or their coast guard, it becomes a PR opportunity for the PRC. Um, and I think that uh, we need to think about how we get some more um, white halls in there um, to, to be the front line of defense. And then the sad part of doing that is you have to get through uh, kind of how you fix procurement in Washington because the poor Coast Guard, and literally poor Coast Guard, is stuck under DHS, which is not, not where you want to be when you need more, more boats. Um, and so, you know, I think that we need to think about those sorts of things because if we're going to maintain presence in a smart way that doesn't play into the PR factor for them, um, we should just think about those things and think creatively. Um, so just something to, to kind of get the conversation going in, in maybe some other directions for the, for the Q&A. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Bob, I want to come back to you on that PR aspect of this too. Um, the idea of a naval presence or a national uh, maritime presence in particularly in Southeast Asia, but around the world was also sort of central, you know, not just now with the Coast Guard that Rocky's talking about, which, you know, as we all know, has had that um, increasing uh, overseas presence for the very, for those very reasons, uh, sent out to be that face, that more, um, friendly face of American presence uh, overseas. This bounces back, Bob, to what you were talking about in terms of the book you're working on now, right? Uh, could you take a second to uh, give us some context from the U.S. deciding to do the same thing with Constitution right. across around the world in the 1840s? Yes, it does. And of course, I'm just thinking um, my son is on a uh, newly built Coast Guard fast response cutter that's right now on its way cr across the Pacific to its base in Guam. So, wow. um, uh, yeah, so yes, I mean, the United States, the Constitution's mission was really ill-defined on its world cruise. It was simply to go to these different places, but 
um, the presence of the ship meant a great deal. In fact, uh, the one written down piece of instructions that Captain Percival had was to see if there are any coal, any coal in Borneo that we could lease. And the ship gets to Singapore and there in Singapore, there's a very interested guy named James Brooke, happens to be visiting. And Mr. Brooke had only recently become the Raja of Sarawak on the northwest coast of Borneo. And he, for years, he, he, he had come out working for the East India Company and set up in, on, in Sarawak. And he kept telling the British government, send a warship here. Uh, keeps send a warship here. And then he's furious when he finds out the United States has done what he had been telling his government to do, just send a warship. He immediately, by the way, gets back to Borneo. He gets a lease on all the coal before Constitution gets there. Um, so he did okay. But just the presence of the ship meant something as it went to these different uh, outposts. And Again, it's not though it's discovering this world. This world's already in existence. Uh, one of the sailors walks through the uh, bazaar in Zanzibar and sees bolts of cloth woven in Lowell. And, and, and in the Indian Ocean, American cloth was apparently preferred to English cloth, although the cotton in English cloth all came from India. And, and so you had these networks of trade in existence and so one of the things I'm finding in this book is just uh, this documentation of this trade, this spread of commerce through the world. And it is, you know, we sometimes use the phrase showing the flag in a way we don't really think through what it means. It's just this presence here of this worship that, um, and, and everywhere they go, they're encountering other Americans who have gone out as part of this trading network. And when uh, Lieutenant Dale sees the bolts of cloth from Lowell in the market in Zanzibar, he says, we really are a great people. It's unclear how he exactly he means that, but this is this enterprise that was there. And, you know, we do see that with some of these other countries we have been talking about. The Chinese certainly have been showing that spirit of enterprise, which is why they're investing in railroads in Africa and minerals and mineral rights in the um, Caribbean. It's uh, an enterprise and we really lose if we're not anticipating this and doing it before we need the gray holes in order to recover something that's been lost. So um, this is a very interesting discussion and I feel like the more I am talking, the less Rocky and Jim get to talk. So um, I could go on for, for the next hour or two, but I will defer now. I was just going to add one thing and one theoretical point to what you were just saying, and I think it'll conform exactly to what you just said about Constitution. Constitution in the 1840s is not a serious warship anymore. I mean, it's, it's a, it was great in the oh, state yeah. and so forth, but technology is yeah. moving on. Yes. But looking back at British history, if you, there's one way to look at uh, British, the British during their imperial heyday got really good at, at uh, naval diplomacy to the point to the point where they could actually have a single frigate show up on a, on a foreign station and the local populace and Britain's trying to influence that local populace or, or whoever, if they knew darn well that the, the full combined might of the Royal Navy stood behind that frigate, yes. at right. that point it became a, it became a symbol, it gave, became a symbol of Great Britain and the Navy, and that gave it political thought. So I, and I, think that's, I think that's why the Constitution was able to do that sort of mission because yeah. the United States is becoming a force to be reckoned with, and at that point, at that point we're starting to do the same sorts of things. I don't think we ever has, have gotten as good at it as the British were just because they had a lot more time doing it. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it is, the idea of a symbolic ship is kind of neat, especially since we're, it's our ship of state now. So it's even, yeah, it's, right. even more symbolic. Right. Unfortunately, I can't do a world cruise anymore. But That's sure. right. <laughs> there is one little story that I'll share. Uh, the Constitution left um, Guangzhou and was on its way to Manila. And they had heard rumors when they left the U.S. in 1844. And then, of course, that was a presidential election year. And the big slogan was 54-40 or fight. The United States was going to go to war with Britain over the Northwest Territory. 54-40, the Northwest, uh, the boundary of what's now Vancouver, British Columbia we, and Vancouver. We wanted that to be our Northwest border. So they leave with this rumor of a war with England. And then they skip India. They don't visit India. They do go to Singapore, which was a free port. And then, as I said, they're in China for a couple of months. And then they're leaving China. And suddenly they see about 10 ships approaching by, from Manila. And it takes them a while to determine whether they're, are they French? Are they English? Are they Spanish? And then they do see there are a couple of them are steam vessels. One is a frigate, a 74-gun um, battle line of battleship. 
and they see it's carrying the British Admiral's pennant. And they have no idea what this, what this fleet is doing. And these 10 ships sail across Constitution's bow, and then they circle the ship, and then they sail across the stern, and then they line up, and then they see one of the, they see signals going back and forth between the Admiral's vessel and one of the steamers, and then a boat comes from the steamer, and all Captain Percival can imagine is they are coming to attack us. The war has begun. So he has the men beat to quarters. Every man stand, the men are standing at their guns, ready to fire. They're in battle formation as this um, boat approaches, and a British lieutenant steps aboard and all he sees is on the deck, everyone primed, ready at their guns. And Percival said, is it peace or war? And this guy's very surprised. He says, well, it's peace, of course. The British fleet, they, they had been uh, become for about 10 days. It took them 10 days to go 100 miles. They were running short of provisions. They wanted to know if they could borrow some bread and whiskey. So, of course, the mood changes. Not, you know, but imagine that. Constitution was going to take on this British fleet in the South China Sea, and they all knew this would be over in minutes because, of course, these are much more powerful ships. And this ship is already an antique. One of the reasons the Navy had sent it is the Navy didn't know what else to do with this ship. And I think they were partially hoping it wouldn't come back. And uh, Percival was kind of a, uh, talk about a bad assery, or maybe, maybe more pain in the assery was Percival. <laughs> so, um, but there it was. The last time Constitution is ready to take on the British fleets in the South China Sea, and it doesn't happen. Um, you know, along those lines, we were talking about this idea of Constitution, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard today, naval ships today, sort of being that uh, presence, uh, waving the flag, uh, showing off and representing, as Jim put, that much larger power behind that single vessel. But we've actually had a, a couple of questions from attendees about sort of the opposite of that, um, that very visual presence. And that's the role of submarines and autonomous vehicles in both uh, affecting that same kind of power um, display uh, and also in terms of being uh, an effective deterrent uh, or even combatant um, in the South China Sea. Where does, uh, where does the undersea uh, element of this uh, strategy either in terms of manned submarines or autonomous vehicles sort of stand at this point? I guess that sounds, oops, I guess that sounds like one for me or at least to lead off with. There's, there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of debate in this realm, as you can imagine, just because I think submarine and anti-submarine warfare is always so mysterious, uh, especially to those who, us who don't. I used to go underwater, but not for a very long period of time. But the, uh, there's sort of, it, it's, it's almost like there's two countervailing uh, ideas about the future. First is the idea that uh, sensor technology, artificial intelligence, all these things are, are going to get so far ahead that we're going to have the ocean essentially become transparent to sensors for the first time and submarines will no longer be able to just basically hide, dive and dive and disappear. And I, so that's, I mean, that's, if you think about that, it's a, it's a really fascinating potential future to, in fact, I did some writing about it a few years ago, just because it was a fun, a fun game to play, but it's, it, it felt to me like if that happens, then undersea warfare will become a lot like more like air warfare where we will try to do stealthy things like we do with airplanes and all this kind of stuff. Fights are going to probably happen at very close range instead of over long distances the way they can now and that sort of thing. The, uh, another, and this is a China specific uh, line of argument that you hear from time to time, and for, including from the Chinese who are, who are always boosting their own capabilities. They, uh, they contend that they're on the, uh, the brink of uh, making a, a leap ahead in uh, propulsion technology that will make their, their submarines super quiet, ultra quiet for the first time. They've been kind of, a, they've been sort of a running joke uh, in the U.S. Navy for many years now. In fact, one of my uh, colleagues at work who I used to, who, whom I've known for 30 some years, he, uh, he said submarines during the Cold War used to joke about Soviet and, so, and Chinese submarines. I mean, listening for them, which is what we do underwater, is like uh, listening for two skeletons making love inside a metal trash can. <laughs> they were that hard to find. I mean, they were just basically announcing their pr presence. They've come a long way since then. What happens uh, What happens if Chinese, uh, Chinese submarines do become like what we're familiar with in our own Navy, with Russia's Navy, Japan, Japan or whatever? 
I think that's probably, I think that's, and I think that's something to, to think about in the South China Sea, which uh, China pretty clearly sees as a submarine bastion. That I think is where its ballistic missile submarines are gonna hide out. That is one reason it's so strident about our not doing going in and doing military surveys, underwater surveys and that sort of thing. They don't want us to know that potential battleground because that's what they want their submarines to hide. Uh, that's where they're. That's where they're very concerned with the Luzon Strait, which connects the South China Sea with the Pacific, goes between Taiwan and, uh, and the Philippines. That's also a geographic uh, uh, waterway that they they pay a lot of attention to as well. So, it's it's, it's, it's it, I'm not sure exactly which one of those branches that we're going down, or whether something else. But uh, there's there's like you said, like Rocky said, it's interesting times lie in store in the undersea realm as well. You mentioned UUVs. I, uh, I don't actually have a clear sense of how those things are going to play. I'm actually kind of a, I'm not, I'm not a skeptic of unmanned vehicles. I am a, a skeptic about unmanned vehicles that we think are going to go out and be just like ships and stay at sea for a very long period of time. Anybody who's ever served on a ship, you're, you're constantly working on that thing. It's, I mean, can you really make a, can you really make an unmanned vehicle with no maintenance personnel on board? What happens when something breaks? I, I tend to see them sort of as short-term payloads that could operate in confined areas for limited periods of time. We will see. We'll see what the technology people say, but uh, that's maybe I'm just maybe I'm just getting aged out by technology. But it's, uh, it doesn't feel like a, a near-term prospect. You know, that's a wonderful uh, segue to something, Rocky, I'd like you to address, but it ties into what Bob was talking about too. The nature of the sensors that we're talking about, both in terms of underwater sensors, but also in terms of that communication speed. You know, Bob was talking about finding the prints and, and they've been becalmed for so long at sea. And here we, as we said at the very beginning of this, we have in minutes this, this communication back and forth. But as that sort of relates to uh, the development of AUVs, I don't think what many people in the general public are familiar with is that even in the commercial realm, this is something that's beginning to be considered. Um, and mostly because of that uh, increased sensor capability and communication, but may still have some of those inherent problems that you're talking about. Rocky, I'm wondering if you could take a second to to sort of tell us what's happening with the idea that we don't need to worry about cruises on tankers and freighters anymore. Yeah, I, I, I'm a little skeptical of that. I, I'm with Jim, really. I think that that uh, that that's a, it's unclear to me it's worth the, the cost savings. You already have these massive commercial vessels carrying an uh, incredible amount of cargo with 15 or 20 crew members it's not the crew is typically not the main cost driver it's usually the fuel is the main cost driver and the capital expense of the ship and so to get that down to to, to single digits or near zero i i just don't see it as being that important um and and you're not you're you, they've already automated so much but you there's real value to having humans on board i mean i think that People underestimate how harsh the environment of the sea is. And, and I, to what Jim was saying, I mean, I think this is where I view autonomous vessels from, and again, I'm a civilian, so I'm, 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 I'm getting a little out of my depth here, but I think that the, the commercial technology is interesting, and I think it can be a force multiplier for naval vessels where they are in control of things and can disperse their presence um, and, and potentially deploy them in interesting ways. And that'll, that'll be interesting to watch. Uh, one other commercial aspect that I think uh, is often forgotten, but shouldn't be, uh, which is um, almost all of the, the international uh, and overseas internet traffic and financial traffic goes, goes on, the, on the seabed. And uh, there's, there's uh, roughly 200 critical undersea cables that carry the international internet traffic globally. And actually, the Luzon Strait between Taiwan and, and the Philippines is a is a real critical choke point. So, you know, if we were, and I don't think anyone wants to get to this, but if we were to slip into a, a hot conflict centered around that region, to have those things cut um, would be uh, devastating to financial markets and would be a, a real, um, it would be a real challenge. Um, and the same for the satellite technology. I mean, I think these there, all the satellite technology that we have and, and GPS and surveillance, it's, it's really, it's great, but it's also vulnerable, of course. And so we, um, it's, it's very hard to get our, um, our, our forward presence capability in our navies to always 
train on the on the backup systems that don't rely on satellites to how to navigate without the satellite technology, how to communicate effectively and how to build up other layers of uh, like using aerial alternatives. Um, it's uh, we have a reliance because it's such an effective way of global communications, but it then becomes a vulnerability. And these are all the challenges. I mean, I do think that the pace of technological change and the fact that the commercial side is developing um, kind of dual use technologies, whether it's sensors or undersea exploration for seabed mining, and all of a sudden there's dual use, and that could put some real challenges on, on, on our Navy and how we think about things, because those can be surprises if we slip into conflict um, in a hot way. So, you know, it's just, I, I would just say there's a lot of uncertainty as we uh, kind of enter here the 2020s. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's really hard to figure out how we invest our limited resources to build a naval capability that can take into account all of these things, especially because I think with all the COVID stimulus, I mean, we're not going to have, we're going to have uh, some fiscal austerity coming on the other side of this. And that, and we're going to have to figure out how to do more with less. And that's going to put a lot of pressure on a lot of budgets. And so, you know, it's, it's a concerning time because we have to think about how we, um, how do we mitigate the risk as cost effectively as possible. Um, and, and those are, those are, no, that's not an easy task. So uh, just, just something out there. I mean, I think that, um, and again, I kind of get back to where, you know, kind of toward, toward the end of this talk to the beginning, which is, I think it's important for people to realize that we have this heritage and that, that our geography is not going to change and all, in all the, in all the scenarios moving forward, uh, we're still going to be this powerful natural resource rich, uh, country in, in the Americas, which is a largely peaceful part of the world. Um, and we have water, we have food, we have a lot of energy, which gives us lots of advantages. Um, but, uh, but how we maintain a global stable system that is to our advantage um, in a cost-effective way is, uh, that, that's a, it's a hard question. Um, and there's no exact right answer. No. Uh, and, you know, there never has been, right, Bob? Uh, you started this talking about that Congress didn't necessarily uh, agree to begin with on right. even the creation of a Navy to go do this. That's right. Uh, Jim, going forward, what's your thoughts on budgets and, uh, and achieving these goals based on sort of the strategy that you're outlining? I think we're still coming to get terms with that. Uh, the Navy, the, the Navy, it's the, an interesting thing. And I don't think I'm giving away anything sensitive, but the, the when we were talking about uh, one way we're trying, trying to get around the budgetary constraints that are probably coming our way is just by, as I, as I mentioned at the close of my talk, it's by, is by integrating what the Navy, Marine Corps and Coast Guard do together, together a lot more closely than we do now. That's a, it, it seems like, I mean, it, to your person who doesn't specialize in military and naval stuff, it, that seems like kind of a, it's kind of a no brainer. But the fact is that after September 11th, the Marine has been a second land army for uh, 20 years. The Navy's basically been a fire support uh, force for operations in Afghanistan and Iraq and so forth. The Coast Guard's been doing its other thing, its own thing in another uh, department and so forth. We got to try to get a, mar a common maritime culture. The, the services are starting to call themselves the Naval Service, singular. Which I think is which I think is actually a pretty uh, is, is a pretty uh, powerful thing. I guess we'll see we'll see whether uh, politicians in Washington agree with that since the since the Coast Guard is not uh, part of the part of the Department of Defense. So that's part of it. I think that something that and, and this is a little bit off the topic, but something that Rocky was talking about a minute ago about uh, about uh, different ideas in the commercial world, trying to get down to unmanned crews and all this kind of stuff. I would draw, actually in the naval sphere, I would actually draw a bigger point. It, it, it feels to me as though we are watching before our very eyes a lot of bad ideas that were brought into the services right after the turn of the century debunked the, before our eyes. Uh, the, the idea that you can have a minimal, a minimally manned crew, and therefore you can do, you can have, uh, you can keep up a, a large warship with with half the number of people or less. The uh, 
one of the one of the whipping boys in the in the in the navy today is the literal combat ship. It's a three. It's it, it's a, supposed to be a small ship, except it's three thousand tons. We were going to try to operate it with forty people, and they were all going to have multiple jobs. Well, you know what happened when we started that when they started going out. Everybody's trying to do a zillion jobs, and everybody's tired all the time. So the navy was forced to double the crew, or not not quite double, but uh, but very much uh, bulk up the crew and so forth. And I think we might I think we might be seeing the end of the tunnel uh, there. The uh, Rocky was talking. It's, it, uh, other idea. One thing you one thing you find out about navies and military services is, is that we're kind of uh, we're kind of faddish, especially when we look at the business world, the commercial world. It, it feels like the in in fact, I am pretty sure I'm right about this. The just in time thinking really took it took hold in, among the in the navy and the military logistics systems, where you don't have where you don't keep enough stuff on on station to make your own repairs and so forth. If, if I need a if I need a if I need a part, I order back home and one comes. To, Man, I'd say it's, 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 it's just a different world from the commercial world where you do strive for efficiency. In the, in the military world, you don't necessarily want to be efficient. I don't want to have just enough sailors and just enough stuff and supplies on, on board. I need a surplus in case I take, go out and take hits in battle. I need more. I need some people so I can plug them in if somebody gets hurt and so forth. I, so I think it's, it, it, feels like, it feels like we're coming back to reality. Hopefully that's going to, hopefully uh, putting it into some of those bad ideas is going to help us be more efficient in using our budgetary resources to, uh, to, to get things right. This movement that I mentioned towards uh, lots of small, lots of small single mission ships that, uh, that can still deal out punishment. I think that's, if you, uh, I mean, for example, Taiwan has, has fielded small stealthy missile craft for, for use in the Taiwan Strait. Those things call, cost all of about $69 million. Whereas, uh, whereas if you look at the zoom wall class destroyer, those things are going for about four billion dollars a copy. I can I can build a whole lot of missile boats for four billion dollars. So, I mean, that's about the price of an F, of one F F sixteen, if not a little bit less. If you, so, if we could, if we get back to reality and start to uh, start doing things smarter, I think that we can actually make this work. We'll see with we'll, we'll see how things go uh, with the elections this fall and. Uh, uh, the next four years with whoever is in charge in the White House, but uh, I, to, I at least have some—I have some hope that we're turning the corner. Well, it is uh, those arguments again echo back to arguments that were made historically. Uh, Jefferson's gunboat navy was uh, a critical sort of, you know, alternative, uh, and looked after in that regard. Uh, although in that particular case, maybe you could argue not as as successful. Um, but also, again, Constitution itself, uh, that hybrid vessel um, designed to serve those multiple functions of, of both force and power projection uh, and yet speed across a lot of the world's oceans, albeit with a crew of 450 rather than 40. Uh, so we are improving a little bit in that regard, even if the LCS is a little overboard. Um, pardon the pun. Hey, here's a here, here, let me uh, let me encroach on Bob's territory again. Here's a here's a here's a fun point of uh, uh, sort of a Boston point. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, wrote a wonderful uh, history of the War of 1812, and, and he was it's and he was disrespectful to Jefferson. I, I mean, he was. Yeah. I'm a I'm a Roosevelt guy, and he he was so he was so disrespectful. I was angry at him when I I did my dissertation on TR in my first book. But the but you know what? In 1907, when he gave a message to Congress, the foreigner of the State of the Union address, he was talking about how to organize a navy. He said it's basically two parts. One, coastal, coastal destroyers, coastal submarines, sea mines, guns, and all that kind of stuff, so that the port can defend itself. If you can do that, if you can hold an enemy fleet at bay with that kind of stuff, guess what? Guess what? The Navy, the battle fleet, it becomes, he calls it footloose. Sounds like a movie from the 80s. <laughs> the, the, the Navy, can, the, the battle fleet can go out and roam the sea. It can fight an enemy Navy. Uh, project power short guard commerce or whatever the case may be so yeah i think tr just dis i think he just basically disliked jefferson and therefore dissed his strategy but you know what he ended up he ended up basically agreeing with it provided it was uh, it was correctly done so uh, although he, he would never admit it he was always right but uh. <laughs> well uh Jebba, we are just past 5 30 we said we we're going to try and keep this to 90 minutes i appreciate your time uh, but i do want to give each of you uh one last chance to uh, express any final thoughts or considerations based on the conversations we've been having. Um, I apologize to those attendees who may have had other questions we haven't even had a chance to get to. Um, and uh, this video will be uh, available through Watch Again uh, on YouTube. Um, Bob, coming back to the history of this, any uh, final thoughts on, uh, on this uh, context of the 1800s to today? 
Well, I've really learned a lot here. And I think the most important thing I draw from both uh, Rocky and Jim, one is the geography of our country, which gives us these great advantages. And then from Jim, of course, we also have that strategic concept of badassery. And I think both are really essential to our success in the future. Oh. Rocky, from a commercial standpoint? Yeah, I just think I, I would just close with this. I think that it's it's always important to keep in the global the global dimensions. Uh, as we as we think, you know, here in Boston, you know, we've we've really grown to become a global city, um, and uh, that's mostly been through our airport, which now has direct flights all around. Uh, but we but it's built on there's there's historical inertia there. It's always been a global city in many ways. If you go back and study the history of of New England and the and the trades with China and others and Japan, and so I think that it's uh, it's it's why. I, I say I say this as well because I think it was an important point Bob made that that China, which is increasingly our our sort of clear primary competitor, they really uh, they they spend more time on the rolling average studying history, whereas here in the United States we when when people say that's history that that's unfortunately a colloquialism for that's not important um, and I I really uh, and I I try to really press it on my three kids that history is really important because it's a guide. And, and I think one of the things that's been really neat in this 90 minute conversation is how often our current challenges here in 2020 have been dealt with through the history of the USS Constitution from its er the early days of the Republic to when it was out on really emissary missions, symbolic missions, but that, that, that as that these things repeat themselves and that you can learn from history and it, it's not exactly ever a clear parallel, but you could draw on lessons for history to have a more informed thinking as we kind of try to push forward here in this uncertain era. So, but it's been a great honor. So thank you for the invitation. And it's uh, just been great to be on, on this panel with everybody. Thank you. Jim, any last thoughts on, on those lines? Uh, I, guess, I guess it sort of fits with what Rocky was talking. I mean, it, in, fact, in fact, I think we're all sort of uh, dancing around the since since my since my one liner about Captain Stewart seems to have resonated. I mean, it's I think I think it, 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 competition really is about human beings, and it's about the culture that we try to imply and plant not only in the country as a whole. I mean, we we were always worrying about sea blindness that that Americans, especially in Kansas and places like that, far from the sea, they don't have a consciousness of what maritime commerce brings to the table and so forth. And therefore, it just doesn't resonate that when you ask for a big navy or whatever the case may be but uh, in the services one of my favorite one of my favorite philosophers was a uh, he was from the grapes of wrath generation eric hoffer he was a self-made philosopher out in san francisco in the 19 uh, in the 1940s and 1950s he wrote a book and but when he was trying to he was looking at how change happens and why people find it so such an ordeal he calls it the ordeal of change but one of the things he, and, and when he's trying to pee, it's a puzzle this out, he's, he said that really inventive ages were, were playful ages. They were almost whimsical ages. He, he talks about uh, Elizabethan England or, or uh, ancient Athens. These were places in which people not only were not punished for, for having uh, oddball ideas and taking them out and testing them out, but they were actively celebrated and rewarded for it. This is a, this I think is the kind of uh, culture that we are uh, that I hope we're trying to instill in the naval service, the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, the military, and I hope I hope in the country as as, as a whole. Because if we if, if any if any oddball is uh, free to come up with some idea and either market it in the commercial world or, or put it into practice in the military world, diplomacy, whatever the case may be, I think we're going to be a lot better off. That's one reason I actually I actually am pretty fairly upbeat about the competitions with China and with Russia, Iran, whoever the case may be, is because I I think that is still our asset, and I think that and I think that as long as we are who we are who we who we think we are, I think we're actually going to be okay over the long haul. It's going to be a long haul like the Cold War in, in all likelihood, but I think that uh, I think we're actually pretty well positioned over the long term. Thank you. Uh, well, you know, in line with that, then I will uh, remind everybody as well as our attendees that. USS Constitution itself was kind of an oddball design and idea uh, when she first came down the rails. And so that oversized frigate that was able to move fast and still carry power uh, was indeed uh, a sort of uh, whimsical, maybe a stretch, but definitely, uh, definitely unusual at the time and surprising to her competitors.
Uh, John, thank you very much. I really appreciate your attending today. Thank you to uh, all of our participants and attendees who joined us live today, had questions or participated in a chat that occurred alongside. Uh, again, this uh, panel will be uh, archived on YouTube. Uh, we did have one other question from attendee saying, when's the next panel? And we will, in fact, uh, be holding additional events uh, toward the end of this year. Stay tuned to our website, uh, ussconstitutionmuseum.org, or any of the USS Constitution Museum social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, for updates and news on our next panel discussion, which is uh, already in the works. Uh, no spoilers yet. Um, so again, thank you all for your attending. Thank you, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.